Hey everyone, welcome to the Azure Infrastructure Update and the mid-March 2020. So my original goal was to provide this information on what's new related to Azure Infrastructure. And it was going to be monthly, but after the original two weeks ago, a lot of feedback I got was really, well, every two weeks or bi-monthly would be more useful. So I'll now do one at the middle of the month and at the end of the month. Uh, the other big bit of feedback I got was could I stop the glare off the top of my head and no there's nothing really I can do about that. So yep, goal less than 15 minutes, I'm not going to do this intro every time. If you look at the notes in the YouTube, um, I'll link to various things. Um, a good friend of mine Cameron Fuller also suggested do a little blog for each of these for people who don't like videos but would rather just read it. Absolutely, I'll start doing that as well. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, please. Uh, then it will just show up for you when I create a new one. Give me feedback. And I'm still working on these little challenger coins I'll send out, which when someone does a really cool piece of feedback, a good comment, share something, uh, I'll send them a little challenger coin. So let's get going. Uh, PowerShell 7 was released. And you'll notice it's not PowerShell Core anymore. It's just PowerShell 7. And this really stresses the idea that this now positions it as the core, the primary version to use. It now has this 85% compatibility for the modules of Windows PowerShell. Windows PowerShell was fantastic, it's very mature, has great functionality, but this is the future. So if you've not already, PowerShell 7 is now released. Uh, go get it, start learning it, use VS Code to edit. Uh, use Windows Terminal if you're on that interactive shell on Windows. And again, this is cross-platform. So I can use this on Windows, Linux, Mac OS. Works fantastic with the AZ PowerShell module, so go get it. Time to switch. The Azure AD app experience uh, has been updated. So there is this new user interface available for the end users. If you go to the myapps.microsoft.com, this is the experience. There is this new one. And I can go ahead and enable it either for everyone or particular groups of users. So at my Azure AD tenant, I go and turn this feature on and then my users will see, hey, do you want to go and try this new experience? Azure Security Center has been updated. So now there's this continuous export capability available. And I can do that to a Log Analytics workspace, i.e. Azure Monitor. So when I do this, I could now trigger alerts through Azure Monitor based on that data sent to Log Analytics. I can also send it to Event Hub. Event Hub is how we would typically integrate a third-party SIM system. So now my Azure Security Center alerts can go to Log Analytics and or Event Hub. Additionally, for those just-in-time experiences, think about, hey, I want to get to this virtual machine. Um, I use the JIT to enable an RDP connection to it or an SSH connection to it. Well, now there's a justification field I can use that helps in that logging to see, well, why was this done? And one of the pain points in the past was it didn't affect functionality, but it was kind of messy. Um, just-in-time access works by modifying network security groups, and it would leave the old rules around. Well, now it cleans those up. So those redundant rules will be cleaned up. So it makes it a lot neater. Azure Backup. We now have backup reports. So through Azure Monitor, uh, Azure Monitor Workbooks, we now have this ability to track and audit our backup and restore jobs. Um, that could be across Azure Virtual Machines, across SQL in VMs, across SAP in VMs, across DPM workloads coming from on-premises. There's lots of filters to slice and dice. And again, it does work across those workload types. For our virtual machines, we have two new kind of SKUs available to us. So we have the NDV2 GPU VMs. So these are very high-end virtual machines. These are for deep learning training. Um, these could be for high-performance compute. Now these only come in one size today. And that one size has eight NVIDIA Tesla V100 NVLink interconnected GPUs. They also have four non-hyper-threaded cores uh, that are Xeon uh, Platinum 8168 processors. 
672 gigabytes of RAM, 100 um, gigabit EDR InfiniBand networking. So, big boys. There are now the NV V4 VMs. These are GPU accelerated. So if I've got some graphics application, if I've got some virtual desktop, I can use these. They actually let me have fractions of a GPU as well, so we can divide up um, that processor. These are using the MI25 GPUs. Both of these are available in specific regions. So these are not the virtual machines that are available everywhere. They're enabled for certain regions in the US, uh, certain regions in Europe, for example. So go and check the details, see exactly where they are. VM scale sets. So super quickly, um, and that was another bit of feedback I got. It's like if I'm introducing something that maybe is not familiar to everyone, quickly introduce what it is. So virtual machine scale sets are really based on the idea that very often we have multiple instances of something. Maybe I'm doing a web server. And so I will go ahead and I will create maybe three virtual machines. They're all identical, they have to be. If they're part of some balance set, they're all running the same thing. And then typically I'll have some kind of load balancer that on the back end set connects to all of them. There's some kind of health probe going on so it knows which ones are healthy and responding. I have to create those. I have to think about upgrading those. And the point of Azure is I pay for what I use. So if I'm manually creating three, five, ten virtual machines, they're always running. Now I could write something. I could write something I could integrate with Azure Monitor Metrics, that when I hit a certain threshold, I trigger some action to it run that maybe shuts some down, that starts some up. It's really a lot of work on my part. So the idea of virtual machine scale sets is I essentially create, I can think about this gold image. And then I give it certain parameters. I can say, well, I want there bet between three and 10 instances. And I give it like sizes. I want to say I want to scale. And I want to scale maybe based on a schedule. Maybe I want a schedule based on CPU metric. Maybe it's based on some app insights. So it's actually getting data from within the application to see how that's performing. Now I deploy this scale set. I can even deploy it across availability zones. And then what that will do is from that gold image, it will go and create however many I need. It will handle that load balancer. It will add them to the back end set and that will do those various health probes. There are even health application extensions to let the scale set know how healthy that thing is. So that's the idea of a virtual machine scale set. I have a gold image, I can update that and then it will roll up the rest of them based on how I tell it to. But it will add and remove them based on what those scale parameters I set up. So it's much easier. I have the image, it's going to create that for me. So that's the point of virtual machine scale sets. And that could be a load balancer if it's layer four, could be an app gateway if it's layer seven, for example. So what we have is now automatic repair based on the application health. So always, if there was something wrong at the fabric level, if a, a node died, if a rack died, it would heal itself, it would come back. But if the VM was there, even if the application was not doing what it's supposed to anymore, the VM scale set would do nothing. Well, now with this new capability, I can think about, well, there's the app. Oops. The app is running inside all of these things. And what we can do is, based on either the load balancer health probe, or based on kind of this application health extension of the virtual machine scale set, if the app does not return a 200, i.e. I'm okay, then it will consider that unhealthy from an application perspective. And then what it's going to do is, if this one is not returning 200, again, I pick, is it the load balancer health probe or the application health extension through VMSS, what it will do is, okay, this is not responding, it's not giving a 200, it will delete it and just create a brand new one in its place. That's the whole point of scale sets and containers, they're cattle. Um, servers we're used to are pets, 
We name them, we care for them, we heal them when they're sad and sick. This model, they're cattle. If it's sick, we shoot it and we stand up a new one. If the app is not returning 200, we shoot it and we stand up a new instance of the app. So that's kind of a new capability. So automatic repair based on the application health. Scaling policies to control how scaling is actually performed. So now, when we get that quieter time, based on maybe a CPU metric, I've hit below a certain average percent, maybe based on a schedule, now I can say, well, hey, there's default scaling, or I could say, hey, the newest VM gets scaled in first, or the oldest VM gets scaled in first. I now have control of how those scalings are actually performed. I can have instance protection. So instance protection says, the idea is, um, all of these are equal. Every instance in that scale set that's deployed, they're all doing the same thing. No one is special. But I guess in the kind of George Orwell, maybe some are more equal than others. And so well, these ones, I don't want to scale those in. These ones, I don't want to be affected by some maintenance action happening on the scale set. Maybe it's an upgrade, whatever. So I can do instance protection. So during that scaling, uh, during some operation, maybe a re-imaging, do not touch those ones that I specified. I can get instance termination notifications through the scheduled events. I can set a configurable delay. So we have certain maintenance activities that can happen in Azure, like for VMs, we get notified if maybe a reboot's going to occur. Now, if an instance is going to get terminated because of those scale activities, uh, we can get notified and we can have kind of a configurable delay. Maybe we're going to go and do something. Nothing to do with infrastructure. It's supposed to be an Azure infrastructure update. But this is super cool. So Cosmos DB have made two pretty major changes. The first, there's now a new free tier. So this is not a limited time. This is now in my subscription. I can have one instance of a Cosmos free tier. And with that free tier, I get 400 request units and five gigabytes of storage. Now, request units are almost this mystical thing with Cosmos DB. Um, based on how I partition my data, based on how my queries, my operations against Cosmos DB are structured, how they use the partition, the operations I perform might use very few number of RUs, and they might lose lots of RUs. But now we have these 400 RUs just freely available all the time. Also now we have autopilot. This is not autopilot like with Windows 10. This is dynamic scale. It's not auto scaling how we traditionally think that it reacts and increases the RUs with some delay. This is dynamically giving us RUs based on the work we give it up to some maximum number we set. So it's really gonna optimize our cost. Because again, most of the time we don't know how many RUs we need. We have to kind of, we set it at a pretty big number and then we monitor it. Or we've set it too low and we get alerts that it's been throttled. So now with the autopilot, I can still set a maximum, but if it's using less than that, I'll only pay for less than that. And what's really cool is this works with the free tier. So if I have my free Cosmos DB, I can still put autopilot on top of that. So I get 400 free, and if I have to go above that, maybe I've got some increase in what I'm doing at some particular moment, yeah, I just pay for that extra stuff. So this is pretty cool. Um, and an additional thing people talk, talked about was I'm also sending out a weekly update. This is just an email. This really is um, just that you can sign up for. You can head over to SavileTech.com and there's a subscribe button. All I'm doing on this email today, I'm still piloting it. I'm pulling stuff from kind of the Microsoft update feed. I'm going to show you all the free events that are coming up from Microsoft and I'll have some sort of targeted videos and things that are happening. It's just, it's not super narrative, it's really the facts of new features, free events coming up, that's my goal today. But again, based on your feedback, I'll evolve that. Uh, so I've got the free events coming up. If you head over to SavileTech.com, on the right hand side you'll see a subscribe button and there you go. So that was our mid-month update. Uh, please, please subscribe. It really does kind of help me out. Uh, please give this video a like. Please comment. Um, please share. 
and you can follow me on Twitter at NTFatGuy. But yeah, um, I'll see you in a couple of weeks' time with the next set of updates. Until then, take care of yourselves and uh, see you then.